Hello and welcome to 100% Real with Groovy. Today I have Nikki S here and we are going to talk about the things that hold a lot of people back internally from truly seeing the change they want to see in their bodies. This comes to the missing part of every transformation piece which isn't really the fat loss part, but we are also going to be talking about the mindset of fat loss towards the end because everyone is so impatient to get nowhere fast because we really aren't getting to an end destination. There is nowhere to get to. So you're racing to literally nowhere if it's something that you want to sustain forever. The more that you race to get to some arbitrary goal, the less satisfied you're going to feel in the process because you're not allowing yourself to become the person and make that lifestyle the person that you want to live as now. So here's Nikki S. And I'm trying to get the accent right, but I can't get it right. So I'll let you say that. But we're going to start off with the missing part in a transformation, which is allowing yourself to take some time out of fat loss so that you set yourself up for a more effective fat loss phase. So I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Ruby. And uh, I am honored to be on your podcast today. And thank you very much, dear listeners, for uh, tuning in and uh, dedicating some of your time to me today. So as Ruby just said, we're going to discuss the various components of a transformation, starting with a build. And um, what's important to start with, in my opinion, is pointing out that a transformation is divided into phases. So what I feel a lot of people may miss is the part where they are different components of a whole. So your life isn't going to look exactly the same in terms of the diet that you'll be following and the training program that you'll be following where in a fat loss phase you are going to be in a deficit and but in a building phase you're going to be in a slight surplus in a maintenance phase you're going to be at maintenance calories i believe that one of the missing pieces for a lot of people is the fact that you're not going to diet forever for fat loss you're also not going to build muscle forever if anything, once you achieve your transformation or you're happy with where you're at, you might decide to maintain forever. That's that's a possibility. So I believe that what holds a lot of people back from achieving their fat loss goals or from starting a building phase is the fear that either is going to be the rest of their life. So they start a diet, they're super motivated, then they get tired of it and they think, oh my God, this is going to be my life for the next 40, 60, whatever years. No, I can't deal with this. And they stop. Um, but on the other side, when they commit to a building phase, uh, they think, oh, my God, am I just going to keep gaining weight um, and keep gaining body fat? And that's when they also decide to stop or they don't even start this building phase. When I began um, my bodybuilding journey almost five years ago now, I started with a fat loss phase for various reasons. And then when I decided that I wanted to commit to a building phase, I understood this phasic approach. And even so, I was worried uh, about gaining body fat, which takes me to another mindset or another thought that could be holding you back from achieving these, uh, from committing to a building phase, which is the fear of gaining fat. I believe that that's what a lot, a lot of people may focus on as opposed to focusing on the true purpose of a building phase, which is to increase your muscle mass. So again, just to recap, what might be holding somebody back from committing to this building phase is on one hand not realizing that it's simply a part of the whole a very important part of the whole but also a short-term part of it and secondarily 
the fear of gaining fat because they're not truly focusing on the purpose of the building phase, which is to increase their muscle mass. And increasing muscle mass is going to shape your body in the way that you would want it to be shaped. And instead, they focus too much on potentially gaining some extra body fat. Yeah, it's it's truly allowing yourself to realize that not any not a single phase is permanent. Where you are now isn't where you're going to be forever. The struggles that you're having now aren't the struggles you're going to have forever. The trade-offs you need to make now aren't the trade-offs you're going to need to make forever. But the thing is, if you allow yourself to go through the process, the trade-offs that you're making now won't seem as immense or as difficult to make as they will be in the future because you'll start to appreciate how you feel when you start eating in a certain way. Like, for example, I choose, even when I'm not in a fat loss phase, to eat 90% of my food from Whole Foods. I still enjoy Nutella. I still go out to eat with my partner every weekend. And that is okay because I do it for the sake that it makes me feel good. I digest well. I perform well. I have regular bowel movements. What's the alternative? I'll feel like shit. I will have sluggish energy. I'll crave more food. I'll be more hungry. It's when you allow yourself to, I guess, give in to the short-term gratification of I need to get this, these results now that you feel like it's such a rush to get to the end that you don't have the patience to stay the long term. And like Nikia said, it's a journey of phases. And not only do the phases themselves in nutrition and training change, but you grow through them. You have different struggles. And I remember this analogy that I had like six years ago where it was about stepping on stepping stones where at first they're not stepping stones that you're stepping on. You're climbing mountains because everything, everything seems hard at first. And if you think it's going to be easy, you're already setting yourself up for failure because it's not easy. Change is not easy. You're trying to change your whole lifestyle. How the hell is that meant to be easy? And then you make it even harder for yourself by giving yourself bigger mountains to climb. Like, I need to do it all now. I need to implement all these habits. I need to change this, change that. I need to have it done in a week. Like, when you allow yourself to get stronger over those mountains, they're not mountains anymore. They become your stepping stones. And now you have new mountains to climb over. So with that, we were just touching on the body fat part. And that never would have crossed your mind when you were just chasing fat loss because you were solely focused on chasing a number going down. But then what? So before I answer that question, to your point, I think what's interesting is that the I mentioned these two fears, right? The uh, the fear that your life is going to look like like the phase you're in forever and the fear of fat gain before you commit to a building phase. Right. But I think the underlying fear is the very human fear of the unknown. As you're saying, as you go through each phase, you learn from that phase. So your first fat loss phase is going to look like Bambi on ice. But the next time that you decide to lose body fat, all of a sudden you've learned so much. You know which foods really helped you feel satiated during a fat loss phase. So even if you were dieting on the lowest calories you've ever eaten, it was manageable because you, you had that knowledge. Now, the second time, you're not going to have to rediscover all of those foods. You still have that list, so you're just going to pull it out of the fat loss drawer and you're going to find that your second fat loss phase, your third, your fourth, is so are so much more efficient and all the more manageable and easier. So I just wanted to, to, to say I found it really interesting what you were talking about, which is in the end, when you don't have experience of something, it can look really, really scary. And um, it's only by taking the plunge, so to speak, and building up from where you're at, importantly, setting yourself realistic expectations of goals that you can achieve that are challenging enough that you feel motivated to achieve them, but also not so hard that there's no way 
that with the lifestyle you live right now, you can accomplish them. And over time, you're going to build small success upon small success. You're going to build a knowledge base, and that is going to inform the success of your current phase and the success of the rest of the process of the transformation. So with that rant that I've just went on, I forgot about your original question. So if you could ask that again, that'd be great. That actually just made me think of something more important to go into the other question, and that's why it's so important to have a coach, not only for fat loss, but outside of it. Because if you do it the right way, you're not going to struggle so much with the transition after. But if you do it like any typical person does it, cutting this, cutting that, good foods, bad foods, clean eating, no social events, not even knowing where to focus your progress outside of the scale, outside of your body, you're going to have a really freaking shit time getting out of that, which brings me into the question. The the fear of exiting a fat loss phase, the fear of even if you did not get the results you want in the fat loss phase, but if you've been trying to lose weight forever and ever, the idea of actually not chasing it anymore is the exact thing you need to do. But so many people are afraid of eating more consistently. And just because you're not dieting doesn't mean you are getting into a surplus where you're going to gain extra enormous amounts of fat. There is a gaining phase, which is what I call the building phase, which you can do in maintenance if you're within your first couple of years. But I would say you need to get into a surplus anyway. But if it's just a break from chasing fat loss, that is very different to a surplus. So I think that any transition in any area of life is going to be rocky. It's difficult. We get used to repeating a certain routine over and over again. Just imagine when um, you get offered a new job and you're really excited about it. But at the same time, the first two weeks are probably the most stressful weeks that you ever experience on that new job. And it's simply due to the change. So transitioning from any phase, whether that's from fat loss to maintenance, from fat loss to building, from building to maintenance, they're all that tra- that that one or two weeks where you're going where you're pivoting are going to feel difficult. And again, you've now let's say that you're at the end of your fat loss phase. You most people start with a fat loss phase because unfortunately we do have what's called an obesity epidemic. So many people need to begin with a fat loss phase just to um, improve their general health. So in some cases, when you carry excess body fat, it can take months, sometimes even years before you're completely done with a fat loss phase. Not to say that you're going to be in a deficit the entire time. The way I do it, I normally intersperse the deficit with periods at maintenance. However, you are going to be focused primarily on losing body fat for quite a long period of time. So all of a sudden thinking, oh my God, now I'm done with fat loss. What do I do? can feel quite overwhelming because in a way it's a shift of identity for months or years or or even, you know, a number of, of weeks, let's say 12, 16 weeks, you've been the person who loses body fat. Now you have to change identity. And that's why this circles back to what I said at the beginning. It's so important to understand that these, the transformation, a real transformation is a phasic process because you don't want to identify yourself as the person who loses body fat. You want to identify yourself as the person who is on a long-term lifestyle transformation journey. And that includes phases. So yes, in some phases, you'll be focused on losing body fat, but that's not the whole point. The point is to truly transform your physique, your mindset, and your lifestyle. So you don't want to limit yourself to the thought that all you need to do is lose body fat. And that is already going to help a little bit uh, in making the transition less overwhelming. In I addition, do, I do want to add on to that quick identity crisis because I loved the way that you just said that. It's the I, people are addicted to the idea of dieting. They because everyone around you knows you as a person who's always on a diet, always struggling, maybe seeing results and then getting it back again. And that identity of also always struggling, or I always gain it back anyway, that can hold you back as well. 
Yes, absolutely. And um, in terms of are other ways to smoothen the transition. Now, there's also a uh, component of this identity crisis, this feeling of anxiety that you may feel that comes down to the fact that you've been in a deficit for a prolonged period of time. And uh, that is, well, you are taking energy away from your body and that can over time create a host of changes in your body that are called metabolic adaptations where your body is trying to preserve energy um, to avoid continuing to lose body fat. It doesn't mean that now it's unhealthy for you to do so unless you're very very close to your um, essential body fat levels and going to step on stage. It, it's simply a defense mechanism that the body has uh, and that's what's kept us alive even in times of famine in the past. So due to these um, metabolic adaptations, some of the changes you could see are an increase in hunger and a decrease in your ability to feel satisfied after a meal. Um, and you can also experience some mental changes to where you're a little bit more moody because you don't have a lot of energy availability. And you might also find yourself a bit more anxious and getting more and more fixated on the way that your body looks than you were before. In fact, it's quite funny. Um, I've been through two photo shoot preps and three fat loss phases in total. And I can see that the leaner I get, the more negative thoughts I have about the way my body look looks and the more frequently I check my body. Whereas when I'm not in a deficit, that happens less and less. So in order to smoothen the transition, my advice would be to return to maintenance calories once you're done with a diet and hold those maintenance calories because that's you're going to replenish that energy that you've not been giving your body for some time and that is going to help overcome these feelings of anxiety, these negative body thoughts. I find that after even two weeks were after a deficit where a client has been at maintenance calories and that has happened to me personally, you have a very different outlook and m often much less fear about the next stage in the process because you've allowed yourself to replenish the energy that you had been taking away for the purpose of fat loss. The funny thing is, is that these positive case studies that we can think of, that including ourselves coming out of a fat loss, not having as negative body chatter outside of it that's just confirmation bias from us because that's what happens when you have a coach in that process when i'm looking in facebook groups i see the same people going all out all in doing this doing that and before you know it you don't really see them posting all that much anymore and there were a couple of cases I've spoken about already that have come in saying, I'm doing this prep for this photo shoot and someone has this, like a lot of body fat. And the next thing you know, like 15 weeks on, I can't stop binging. I can't help myself. I'm losing control. What's wrong with me? I'm broken. My metabolism is this. I've stuffed up this. I've stuffed, like, that is a continual cycle that a lot of us coaches friggin' grind our gears over because we see it happening but when you're in the moment it doesn't seem that way it seems so like innocent to chase these things because you want it and you hate where you are now or you never actually expect there to be a negative rebound at the end because it's like I'm doing this with like I got like probably have a crappy coach for it as well that's gonna just shred you down in like 12 weeks 16 weeks and not actually take you out after it or it's like, if you're losing that much body fat straight away, almost like a competition prep, you need to expect really bad ramifications because there nearly always is, especially mentally when it's your first one and you have never been through one before. And if you don't have the guidance and something else you mentioned is what happens as you go deeper into a diet. And I found I've competed eight times on stage now and I was never really that satisfied with my body until I reflect on it now, where my fourth competition and my fifth competition, I looked my best. And then the three after that, I looked gradually worse and worse and worse because I did not give myself enough building time. 
I was depleted. My hormones were trashed. My metabolism was trashed because my hormones weren't functioning properly. I was like, just because I had this body that everyone said, oh, whatever, whatever. Like people would have wanted that leanness knowing them. But just because someone looks good does not mean they're healthy on the inside. And that also means their mindset. Body critique, even as you get to your leanest, expands because you become more body focused, especially if you're hungry, especially if you're craving, especially if your approach is bullshit. That's true. Uh, on the point you made about the importance of having a coach, I agree with the important caveat that you also implied that you need to have a good coach. Uh, there are coaches that, again, circling back to what I said in the beginning, don't really focus on a phasic approach. They focus on um, fat loss primarily. So you could, you might find that they offer six week challenges or 12 week challenges to lose as much body fat as possible. But the problem is that they don't really prepare you for what comes afterwards. They don't teach you how to return to maintenance and maintain those results. And sometimes in order to sell such a, such a short term tra transformation, they promotes extreme methods to lose body fat that work but unfortunately extreme methods tend to only work over the short term whereas over the long term you need an approach that you can actually realistically sustain so that that approach is not going to look very different whether you're at maintenance in a building phase or in a fat loss phase the only real difference will be down to how many calories you're eating on a, a weekly basis so if you have a good coach, that can be extremely stress relieving because, again, the biggest fear underlying the fears that I outlined at the beginning in terms of why people wouldn't commit to a building phase is the fear of the unknown. And a coach already knows what it is that they're taking you through, uh, a good coach. So, for example, I had a client that I took this year through their first building phase ever we started with a fat loss phase and they were very successful then um they we went through a maintenance phase also very successful but they had grown up with diet culture all around them where stepping on a scale meant that if your weight was down that was a good day whereas if your weight was up that was a bad day so Understandably, they were concerned about going into a muscle building phase in a caloric surplus with the express purpose of gaining muscle mass and therefore weight. And what they found extremely helpful, which they've told me several times, was the fact that throughout the maintenance phase, in almost every check-in, I would explain to them what a building phase would look like and why it would be different from both fat loss and maintenance, which we'd already done, what to expect, what might happen that we could not predict, what we could predict instead, what to think if things went a certain way or another way. And I would always reassure, reassure them, I am here with you to answer all of your questions if you have any. And be rest assured that I'm not recommending this phase because I want you to become unhealthy. This is part of the transformation that you've told me you want to achieve. I believe that if you're not, if you if you're not an expert, if you're not a coach, there's no reason why you would know this. So I completely understand when people assume that losing fat is all they need to do to achieve the physique that they are after. But that's only one component of the process. If you if all you do is lose body fat, let's say that you've just started out, you make some gains in that you lose you build some muscle while losing body fat. That's true. But at the end of the process, you won't have had the energy throughout a caloric deficit phase where you have been able to build a considerable amount of muscle. You have built some. But if you haven't built enough, you're only going to look like a smaller deflated version of yourself at higher levels of body fat, which is why it's so pivotal to then commit to a phase where you have enough energy to build muscle. Yeah, and that that's the hardest part for a lot of people to accept that you do need to push in a different direction to get the result that you want. But it also baffles me that people think that this is also highlighting the the good when I say good coaches, 
but why would we want to get you looking like some oompa loompa elephant? Like that is not our goal. We want to get you to where you want to be. That is that is why we program the way we do. And when you mentioned that there is that reassurance, it's if all you've been doing is chasing a lower weight on the scale and you still don't see the results that you see in the mirror, why do you think that forcing that pathway harder is going to enhance any results? It's enhancing a system that is expired. And I put up a tweet the other day saying, Talos is one chapter in a book and it may reoccur, but it's not the whole book. It might come up again in the future, which it most likely will, because once you gain the muscle, you're going to want to reveal the muscle that you just built, depending on if you did a leaner build or a more pushy build. But I think most of us do want to chase the leaner build. It just feels like it's a bulkier build because when you train, you get more blood and carbs and water into your muscles. You feel puffier. And when you have more food in your belly, you feel puffier. And if you're a female and you have more blood in your uterus and water that it retains, you feel more puffier. And that is okay. And you mentioned what to focus on and what to expect. So I'll let you go into that next. Uh, What to focus on and what to expect from a building phase. Transitioning into one, yes. Yes. Okay. So once you decide to transition into a building phase, in terms of what to focus on, you need to accept that this is a phase where you're going to feel uncomfortable, especially as we've been saying, if you've been chasing fat loss for quite a long time. And uh, again, it's only one part of the process and nothing worth having comes easy. So in every endeavor in life, there's going to be a phase where you're not extremely comfortable, you're not extremely happy where you're at, you, but you keep going because you know that you're going to get to the end result that you want. It's like when you're going through university and um, you have to set exams. They are super freaking scary and nerve wracking. And sometimes some people might even say, oh, I hate exams because they're so anxiety inducing, right? But why don't people stop going to university then? It's because they know they that at the end, they're going to get the reward, the graduation, the next, the opening of the next chapter of their life. And that's exactly how you want to feel about a building phase. Yes, it might feel uncomfortable at times to carry uh, more weight than you used to or more weight than you think that you want. However, you are putting on, I like to say pounds for a purpose. So if you're working kilograms, it doesn't work quite as well. There's no alliteration, but you are increasing your weight for a specific purpose. So since you are in this phase where it's a little bit more uncomfortable to uh, look in the mirror, what I would really encourage people to focus on is performance because Building isn't just about what your body looks like and, oh no, woe is me, now I've I've got to gain weight. You actually are going to feel quite a bit different. If in a deficit you can feel quite hungry, you can feel like you're craving food often, and uh, as I said, you might experience some anxiety and more stress than usual. In a building phase, you are going to find, due to the surplus, that you are going to have assuming that you are in a surplus in this phase, you're going to feel more energetic. You're going to feel like you can do so many more things. Your mood is most likely going to be um, in a better place than when you were in a deficit more frequently. Not to say that just with a surplus, this solves all of your life problems, but it, it is quite different from a deficit, at least from a mental perspective. And you are going to have a lot more energy to put into your training, which is why focusing on your performance is important because it is so rewarding. In a deficit, unless you're very, very new to training, you are going to find it harder to make progress. You can, but oftentimes, depending on how uh, reasonable your deficit is and how you reasonably set up your diet is, you may find that it's harder to progress or it's, uh, you know, it's maybe the the only realistic expectation you could have is to hold on to your current level of strength. In a surplus, that is the time to see your progress go up. 
deep again it depends on your experience level as we as i'm sure dear listeners you know if you've been listening to ruby's podcast for a while it, training is a game of diminishing returns the more experienced you become to lower your gains. However, if there is a time when you can see them occur at a at, at the fastest rates that you'll ever see them based on your level of experience, it will be during a surplus. So what I normally recommend my clients is if you feel discomfort at, at certain points about your body, that's uh, understandable, but we also want to focus on all of the positives that this building phase is bringing you, which is now you are strong AF in the gym. So let's set some performance goals. And I don't need to, you to turn into a power lifter. If you're not interested in improving your 1RM, it doesn't, it, it, you don't have to become interested in it. It could be as simple as focus on, okay, in my program, I have a deadlift variation um, or a bench variation. Pick your favorite lift and think, I really want to see this lift get better over time. F channel your mental energy into that. And um, secondarily, it's, not really, it, it, it's still about performance, but in a slightly different um, way, you want to focus on what your body can do for you rather than just on what your body looks like and honestly this is a tip i would give even during a fat loss phase again to counteract those um worsening body image thoughts that you might experience as you get leaner and leaner but it works really well in a, a surplus or in a building phase done in a caloric surplus as well where you want to focus on how amazing it is that your body is healthy enough to enable you to train and how amazing it is that it is healthy enough not only to let you train, but to enable you to increase your strength over time. The body is a wondrous machine and appreciating it for what it can do is going to be much more fulfilling for you than simply focusing on what you look on what it looks like. Because ultimately, if you only focus on your appearance, you're holding yourself back from what you could achieve because achievement isn't based on appearance achievement is based on ability it's it, it's actually funny because i was editing a video that i'll be putting up soon but i had a realization the other day and it was it came out of nowhere i was in the gym and doing my exercises and i saw this girl just squatting and i don't know why i thought of it but i thought back to when i started and when i was gearing myself up to squat under the bar and my focus in the session was let's burn as many calories as possible and burn as much energy as possible I have to do anything I can to just expend more and on my program it had like four sets of six to eight or eight to ten or something no it was four sets of 12 10 8 6 and mm -hmm. me I did like 10 warm-ups of 10 reps each increasing by like 2.5 kilos each time because more work more calories burned but I hated like I struggled to train I did it <laughs> out of literally just trying to change my body and it got to a point where I was dragging ass to the gym I had to force myself to grow it wasn't enjoyable I just did it because I felt like I had to if I stopped I'd gain fat if I stopped I'd lose my gains and now I go in with a purpose of I cannot wait to see how good this looks now to watch back my video to get stronger to see where I can take my squats because I came up with two performance goals at the start of the year because I want to get my 110 squats for five again and I want to get my 150 deadlift for five again and they're my driving factors whereas other people can be like I want to know how I want to be able to do a push-up I want to be able to squat my body weight I want to be able to fix my squat form because a lot of people don't even squat properly and just getting your form right is enough. And it's hard to chase performance when you don't have a strategy. Too many people are changing their workouts every couple of weeks. There is nothing there that you can improve on. If you're always changing, where is the metric that is a constant for you to be improving on face-to-face? -face? But I thought of something for the Ks. You Kilos to be kick-ass because you ah. can't. Because you can't thrive on 1,500 calories and you will never thrive without carbs and you will struggle to get to the gym because they'll feel hard and your energy isn't there. Oh. I like uh, I like it. Kilos like to it. kick ass. I liked it. And there was something you said about the more trained you are, the less you're going to see in terms of gains. And it's it's the nature of progress. 
and it's what you get for leveling up. You level up and your progress isn't going to be to the same extent. But you see people in Facebook groups and everywhere saying, I train really hard. I can't see the gains I want to see. I can't see the muscle I want to see. I'm still struggling to train my glutes. And these same people are overtraining and haven't actually allowed themselves long enough, eating long enough to build the muscle that they want to build. Thank you for sharing your story, Ruby. Now, last but not least, I've already said this, but in terms of what to focus on, you really need to focus on the true purpose of a building phase, which is to train in order to build muscle. Because so far we've mentioned caloric deficits, we've mentioned surpluses, we've been talking about it almost as if nutrition is the most important variable. And it is more important in a fat loss phase than it is in a building phase because training, lifting weights isn't included in your program when you're losing fat for the purpose of burning calories. It's included for the purpose of building muscle. What truly drives fat loss is the caloric deficit that you can create. I normally uh, recommend it to create it primarily via diet with um, cardio or steps as needed. But so therefore, the, dri- the main driving factor of the deficit and of the fat loss will be your diet plus cardio or steps as needed, as I've just said. But in a building phase, it's not the calories that are going to help you build muscle because you could sit on the couch all day eating a caloric surplus and I promise you, and you already know your listener, you wouldn't build an ounce of muscle. What truly drives the main driver of muscle growth is training. So what you need to focus on is not so much what you look like, not so much how much you're eating. Once you've created a surplus, you don't need to keep focus to keep overtly focusing on nutrition, especially not at the expense of training, because training is the match that lights the fire of the change that you want to see in a building phase. And that wraps up the answer to the question, what to focus on. In terms of what to expect from a building phase, when you're transitioning from a fat loss or a maintenance phase, is first and foremost, in a fat loss phase, you would expect that once you achieve a caloric surplus, many people, not everyone, but many people, see quick weight loss, and I, I, I say weight loss because that's important, in the first week or two in a deficit. And the reason why clarifying that the weight part is important is that this isn't only body fat. You're losing some body fat, but you're also losing quite a bit of water because when we're eating carbohydrates, we absorb them with some water. It, we every For every gram of carbohydrate that you absorb, you're going to uh, also absorb about three to four grams, two to three, sorry, grams of water. So, carbohydrates comprise the majority of our calories for most people, unless you're uh, trying a higher fat approach for some reasons. So when you go into a deficit, you're trying to maintain your protein as high as you can. You need a certain amount of dietary fat for health reasons. Then normally what people tend to decrease, because again, it comprises the majority of our calories in in, in many cases, is carbohydrates. When you cut your carbs, you're going to see those water losses. Now, conversely, in a building phase, once you attain a true caloric surplus, you might find that now you see a quick jump in weight in the first week or two. And that is, in part, again, extra water weight from the extra influx of carbs. Because, again, you need a minimum amount of dietary fat for health Uh, But beyond that minimum, you don't necessarily get a lot of benefits from increasing fats massively in a surplus. Um, You also need protein to maintain muscle. But when you have plenty of calories coming in, it needn't be difficult to achieve that. Oh, I say needn't. Wow, that sounded uh, so fancy. Anyway, you don't need to keep increasing your protein beyond a certain threshold. And uh, yeah, I'm very fancy sometimes. And then occasionally I just throw out the occasional fuck and people remember, oh yeah, that's not that fancy after all. Anyway, so for that reason, if you don't need to increase your fats, you don't need to increase your protein unless your protein is under target at the moment. Then, and in addition to that, 
the main fuel for resistance training is carbohydrate, then naturally, when you go into a surplus, you're going to increase your carbohydrate above what you did in a deficit or at maintenance. So that's how you would expect to see some increase in water weight. Many people also tend to get a new training program when they commit to a building phase. So if it's if you have quite a bit of new, quite a few new exercises, you're going to feel to get sore from them because of the novelty factor. And that soreness comes with some inflammation. Inflammation also can drive up your weight on the scale. People get excited when they go into a building phase. They're like, oh, it's my time to make a lot of gains. So they train really hard. Again, that increases soreness and inflammation. They might train harder than they used to even just a week before. And so for all of these reasons, I would not be surprised or worried if your rate of weight gain was faster straight out of the gates than you would want it to be. And um, when I think about when I plan a client's building phase, depending on their um, experience level and on other factors, I would normally like to see their body weight go up at a rate of one to two percent of their body weight gained over a month. However, while in a fat loss phase, you would assess that or almost on a weekly basis because fat loss is a lot faster than muscle gain. In a building phase, I assess these changes in body weight over a two to four week period. So I'm not worried if a client gains a kilogram in a week and the target was to gain a kilogram in a month if we've only just started the building phase. Because in the first two weeks are honestly a settling period for the body to um, enter the surplus. So I would ignore those when you're assessing your rate of weight gain progress. And I would focus on thinking if you are gaining weight at a faster rate than you'd expect, that's good news. It means that you've achieved a true caloric surplus because some people may feel like they're eating a lot, but they've, they're not actually gaining weight on a weekly average basis. And they, they think like they're quote unquote bulking for a, for a month or two. And then if you look at their weight at the end of the two month period and at the beginning, the change is not there. They've essentially only maintained, but because perhaps they've been dieting for so long, now they think, well, I am eating so much more food, but that's only because they went back to maintenance. I love what you just said so much because it's like, you can't, you can't just, you can't just expect the scale to not go up at all and say, oh my God, I made gains. Like if the scale hasn't moved by the end of the month, you did not make any gains. I'm sorry, but no, you did not lose fat and gain muscle at the same time. That is not how it worked. And to your point as well, it's almost like when people say that they're hardly eating, but they're not losing weight. The same goes sometimes for when you're out of a fat loss phase. You are so used to having an empty stomach, not having fullness. It's not your maintenance. You're actually in a slight surplus. And especially for females, you don't need a massive surplus. Females don't need that big of a surplus. But you can't just keep shooting it out of the dark and going like 100 calorie surplus one day and then you're not hungry the next day so you don't eat all your food and then you at the end of the month you don't really get any net gain from that and that was something I did want to say as well because when I looked back at myself over the two years that I struggled to just accept a building phase I looked the friggin same and I'm like I wasted all of that energy when I had spare time and my business wasn't such a big priority and I was able to train like five, six days a week and actually fuel for it and recover from it, I wasted all that time not actually putting myself into a surplus to get the gains that I could have had if I wasn't so scared of gaining fat. I am going to push back a little bit against something that you said because I am a contrarian like that. You said that if your weight doesn't change, you can't expect to have lost body fat and built muscle. Now, I would say that I agree to a point whereby if you are very well trained, Ruby, you've been training for years at this point. Yes, if your weight stays the same, I would still argue that you could have made a little bit of gains, but it would be so small that honestly, if you wouldn't see it. So if that's your case, dear listener, you've been training for years, you've been training consistently. Yeah, in that case, 
absolutely um you can't expect to make massive night or day gains however if you are less trained or you're returning to training after a prolonged layoff then you have a higher chance of being able to build muscle even if you are at maintenance calories because it comes back to what i said before a caloric surplus is the most time efficient way to put on muscle but the calories only enable the muscle growth what truly drives muscle growth is the training so if you are training consistently even if your weight on the scale doesn't change there is no reason to believe that you're not building muscle at all it's a matter of do you want it to happen over a 20 year span or do you want to gain a pound of muscle in 20 years or do you want to gain it in maybe more like six months to a year that's the difference that we're talking about it's not a difference of well, you either build muscle or you don't, depending on uh, being on a surplus or not. No, uh, you don't build muscle only if you don't train. It's a matter of how quickly do you want that progress to occur. And right. if you are, if you want it to happen more quickly, then a surplus is the most time efficient way to achieve that. Yeah, and that was actually a really important thing for you to push back on because I say it all the time. Most people, most people, even if you've been training for years and years and years and years and years, if you're not like a coach or a trainer or know how to train effectively, you can still do both at the same time to start off with. And you can still see your body composition change in maintenance without needing a surplus, which is why I put most of my girls in maintenance because they come to me without having had a structured training program. They don't need that big of a surplus. And that's exactly why I said you don't need that big of a surplus. You need to push the upper end of your maintenance so that you can give yourself the fuel. And it's not like if it is within your maintenance, you're not going to be gaining excess body fat. That is when you can do the body recomp. It's realizing that a proper training program is the difference between you struggling to see any changes and wondering why you can't see the glute gains or shoulders or definition that you want to wondering why did I never do this before? This is awesome. And uh, I'm going to push back against something else that you said now, because again, contrarian here, I grew up with two brothers, so I've learned to argue. And you said that um, you don't need that big of a surplus if you are if you um, are female. I would argue that nobody needs that large of a surplus. You might hear some uh, guys, for example, cisgender men, talk about being in a thousand calorie surplus or else they can't bulk. I, I think that what, once again, the focus is too much on calories when that's not what the in the, the best way to measure your progress. It's not about eating as much food as you can possibly stomach. If you want to measure progress in a building phase, you're going to have to focus on your rate of weight gain. So I, if somebody asked me how many calories should I eat in order to build muscle, I wouldn't be able to tell them eat 500 calories above maintenance or 300 above maintenance. I would tell them you need to eat the amount of calories that you need in order to see your scale weight go up over time at a rate of about one to two percent of gain on top of your body weight every month. So, so that's that's the only point I wanted to make. I think that it's not only that ev not every most people don't need a large surplus. They also don't need to focus on how large the surplus needs to be. The surplus needs to be as big as it needs for your scale weight to move in the direction that is aligned with the goal of building muscle, which is up. It's actually funny because now you made me think on podcasts, we speak a lot of generalities because we don't know who the hell we're talking to and who the hell's listening. And it's different when we're actually coaching clients because we put them through their fat loss phase. We put them through their maintenance phase. We know where to direct them with calories and it's got nothing to do with the surplus. It's just about eating more food and pushing their training. And we we get feedback along the way. It's not like, hey, here's your calorie increase or calories above maintenance to eat consistently. Go do that and go train. It's like, no, we're actually monitoring the whole process. And I feel like where a lot of people get undone, which is something I see and I know that I can relate to it if I was in those shoes, is I would always be pulling out the seed 
without letting it blossom. If I didn't know that I was on the right path, it's like, why would I want to put all this effort into eating more food, probably getting fat and never being able to lose again, probably wasting all my time, all my energy, blah, 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 not seeing the results I want to see. Why would I do that if I'm not going in the right direction? And that's where a coach really does come in because especially when you have your menstrual cycle emotions, PMS, or when you have a wedding date or a vacation and you put on a bikini or whatever, and then you have a trigger point reaction. Oh my God, I need to diet. And you haven't even had a freaking breath away from a diet. <laughs> That's when you keep pulling out the, the seed before you even let it blossom. And then wonder why you can't see any flowers. And then yeah. you have such a bad garden. Like you're the one that keeps pulling out the seed. You're speaking to the importance of individualization, which is what I'm implying when I say you need to focus on achieving the rate of weight gain that signifies progress for you. And and that is the principle that needs to underline any productive transformation process. You can't rely on what anybody might recommend online in when they speak in when they're speaking in absolute terms. So if they're saying you should eat X amount of calories or you should train this way. It might work. It might well work because most methods work for at least one person. Otherwise, people wouldn't waste their time promoting them. But it might not be the most effective method for you. In any case, just to complete my answer on what to expect during a building phase after the first two to four weeks where your body settling into the surplus and you might see a faster rate of gain. At that point, your body would ideally settle into this rate of gain of one to two percent per month that you would want to assess every two to four weeks if you have a menstrual cycle every four weeks depending on how regular your cycle is is likely going to be best when i have a client with a menstrual cycle i compare apples to apples meaning i compare their weight during pms to their weight during pms the previous month and the following month if there's a change in the right direction between those um, met those two, those three data points, we're, we're making progress. Because if you have hormonal shifts in water weight, you're going to see, generally in many cases, you might see an increase during PMS and in the first days of your periods, and then your weight just drops down. You've not suddenly gained five pounds and lost five pounds over a span of two weeks. It's mostly water weight due to your hormones. So for that reason, I encourage you to Look at this over a longer term period if you have a menstrual cycle. So you look at your rate of weight gain every month. If you don't have a menstrual cycle, then you might want to look at that rate of weight gain every two to four weeks instead. And if you're going too fast, then you might want to reduce the surplus. If you're not gaining weight at the right amount, at the right rate for you individually, and again, one to two percent is quite a large range. In some cases, I go below that. Uh, for various reasons, usually related to how experienced the client is. So you'll need to hopefully have a coach or have the experience and knowledge yourself to set the right rate for yourself and individualize that. So you make any changes to your calories depending on whether you're making progress or not. And then the vast majority of your focus, assuming that your diet quality, which is very important in fitness, we focus far too much on macros and calories without focusing on diet quality, which is paramount because 2000 calories of Twinkies are not 2000 calories of whole foods. And we are not what we eat. We are what we can digest and absorb. And if you're digesting and absorbing a lot of nutrients because your digestive system is working really well and you're feeding yourself whole foods, then you are likely going to see far better results whatever phase you are in. So I don't want to discount the importance of your diet quality. But assuming that that is in place, then the vast majority of your efforts need to be put into increasing your performance in the gym and being consistent with training, which is the main driver of a muscle building phase. And in terms of expectations, you'll find that over time, you'll, if at first eating that much food, can seem like a lot and very overwhelming. Maybe you're anxious because you've not done this before. You were focused on fat loss or it's just a really quite a bit amount of food compared to what you're used to. Then um, 
over time that can become easier because you get used to it. But then again, just like you get metabolic adaptations to dieting where your body tries to conserve energy to stop you from being in a deficit, there's also a defense mechanism against excessive weight gain. It's just, it seems to be from the research less strong than the defense mechanism against excessive fat loss. That is how we can develop obesity. But there is one. And once you achieve, once you get close to the upper end of your settling point range, so this range goes from a lower settling point, which is the lowest weight you can be at, uh, and level of body fat really that you can be at and feel comfortable before you start getting really, really fatigued, um, and all of those metabolic adaptations start kicking in at the ninth degree. And then there's a, an upper settling point range, which is the upper limit of your body fat levels past which your body starts to really fight against any more weight gain. The closer you get to that upper limit in a muscle building phase, the harder you might find that it is to stick with that surplus. And that's when normally I would implement a diet break, just like you do during a fat loss phase in many cases. To, and that's either at maintenance or for very advanced people, I would run a mini cut to where you're reducing your calories to give the body a break from the surplus because your body's preferred state is homeostasis or balance where you're maintaining your weight, you're maintaining the same levels of body fat, and you're also, therefore, eating maintenance calories. Once you're pushing the body into a surplus or into a deficit, either it represents a stressor for the body. And just like you give the body a break from a deficit after a prolonged period of time, you might find that in order to continue building muscle and continue being able to stick to the surplus, you need to give yourself a break every now and then during a building phase as well, with the purpose of returning into the surplus afterwards. So this would be the answer to the expectations question. I love that. And you do still need to be intentional outside of dieting, which is why I haven't dieted in years. And I still, if you see my food, pretty much all of it is wholesome foods on the weekends is a different story but still most of that probably 85 percent on the weekends versus 90 percent during the week is still wholesome foods for that very reason plus it has a higher thermic effect plus i will burn a lot more calories eating that way because i will have more energy i will be able to perform more because if you eat like shit and you're sluggish the whole day you're not going to be burning as much energy through the day because you're going to be a couch potato and not an energizer bunny kind of thing. I would only say that I wouldn't focus on the calorie burning effect of eating whole foods because the purpose of eating a, um, a healthful diet is to have the energy levels, the mental focus to thrive and to pursue whatever goal might be at hand, whether that's building muscle, losing fat, or maintaining and trying to build muscle despite being while well being at maintenance calories. That is the the purpose of eating in a certain way. It's not really to uh, burn more or fewer calories, at least from my perspective. I like that because that's also a mindset shift away from the calorie burn towards something that actually enhances you as a person, and that's how you should see most things. Because if everything's just focused around numbers, that's not qualitative, that's quantitative and qualitative is where you live. And sometimes a coach's job is also to stop you doing dumb crap instead of just telling you to do something. It's stopping you from changing your macros, every knee jerk reaction you get because you feel a little bit fluffy or whatever else. And also I want to say on the body fat set point range, you have to realize that it is easier to stay within that and have your body do its thing within that the longer you've been doing this lifestyle for. Because if you're still attuned to the negative habits, the negative lifestyle, the food cues, the, if your partner isn't supportive, you're going to find it harder to stay under that upper threshold because you're going to force it that way because, hey, have you heard of the dessert stomach? That is true. And I believe that an important mindset shift that underpins a truly successful transformation comes back to the, what I said in the beginning, understanding that it's a phasic approach. And what I mean by that in the context of calories is to detach yourself from the belief that eating 
as few calories as possible is quote unquote good and that eating a lot of calories and what people mean by a lot is very relative too so it really makes no sense to feel that way but to detach yourself from the idea that eating a lot of calories is quote unquote bad eating a certain amount of calories is neither good nor bad in absolute terms it's all relative to your goal. If your current goal is to build muscle, burning a lot of calories and eating as little as you possibly can is completely counterproductive. So in that case, it's bad to um, try to do a lot of cardio, do a lot of steps, sap your energy to create an energy deficit because it's simply not the goal. It's not part of that phase. But when you're pursuing fat loss, then burning more calories creates a larger deficit. It helps you along towards that goal. So in that, in that case, we could call it quote unquote good. So what's important is to understand that again, each tool isn't good or bad per se. It's appropriate to the goal or not appropriate to the goal. And if you can make that mindset shift and start appreciating every tool, depending on the goal that you're pursuing, you're going to get very far in your physique development journey. I'm gonna, because you summarize that really well, I really want to just highlight one of the posts you put up on your page, which I loved, because it's something that all of us good coaches reiterate, and that's, it's not about discipline or wanting it bad enough or willpower. It's about having the right method for you. And like we said in here, it's phasic, it's individualized. It's learning through the trenches of going through it and not trying to fit your health and fitness around your life. It's as in fit your life into health and fitness. It's about adapting it to your lifestyle, but realizing at the same time that your lifestyle right now isn't serving you. So you are going to need to change. It's just, you need to fit it in to gradually do it there. And doing all the right things and ticking the boxes isn't enough to see results. You need to do it consistently for long enough. So I'm going to let you summarize what I just said there because I got some of those points from your post and I really liked it. Well, first of all, thank you for reading my content. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that you found it valuable because it gives me hope that other people will do as well. And if I were to summarize the conversation we've had and just leave our dear listeners with a few learning points, it would be understand that the process of making a true lifestyle, physique and mindset transformation is divided into phases that in order to make the best progress that you're capable of, you need an individualized approach. And that every phase will get easier over time as you gain more experience, but you can only gain more experience if you're consistent. And consistency needs to underpin every aspect of your transformation journey because you could be optimizing absolutely everything for a single day that would that lead to you making the utmost progress you possibly could no you would look the same tomorrow but doing being 80 to 90 percent consistent for months and years where not everything is optimal because your life is in flux and you need to adapt your targets to the season of life that you're in. But at any point in that life, you're trying your best to be as consistent as possible. That is going to net you far more results than a single month where you're knuckling down with the most quote unquote optimal um, approach that is unsustainable in the long term. And then falling off track, so to speak, or abandoning that approach because you simply can't truly sustain it as part of a new lifestyle. I freaking loved that. That is bloody awesome. Can you guys please, please, please stop this and rewind it back like five minutes and actually write that down? Because having that on a vision board, on a wall, actually having it written down for you to look at is probably the best reminder that you could ever have in your journey because without that you're left with impatience and like you said falling off track so I hope you gained more than 10 nuggets of wisdom from this because there were quite a few and if you found this of any benefit please let me know and let Nikias know as well and I will have his Instagram handle down below and you can go find him as well 
but honestly, write it down, read it over, and remind yourself you're human, you're not a robot. Things aren't meant to be perfect, and they never will be because that in itself is subjective. Well, Ruby, I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on your platform. I truly appreciate it, and I really enjoyed the conversation. And dear listeners, if you want to reach out to me, uh, please do go to my Instagram. I am very chatty, as you might have uh, caught on by now due to the length of this podcast. But also, you can reach out to me via email at fit to transform at gmail.com or on my website, which is fit to transform training.com and i'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have or to answer any feedback and i just want to give you to leave you with a big thank you for lending me some of your time because we're all very busy and the fact that you're here now really shows to me that you're committed to this transformation process and i could not be any more honored to play even a little part in it Thank you for coming on and it was such an amazing chat. Thanks guys.